Raising private money for your real estate deals is easy when you know the simple steps it takes to attract private money, and that's without chasing anybody and not chasing any banks. Well, welcome to Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Now, today I'm talking with Glenn Sutherland. He's a Canadian that is virtually investing in the United States and he never borrows money for his deals from the bank. How does he do it? That's right. He uses private money. So if you've been wanting private money and never have to rely on banks again for your real estate deals, then you don't want to miss a second of this episode. Let's dive in right now. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, my guest today is a real estate investor all the way from Ontario, Canada, where he lives with his wife and his two fantastic, terrific children. Well, he started his investing journey purchasing buy and hold rental real estate um, there in his local area. And after a lot of research, my guest learned of a more favorable way of doing business as in how to, you know, do this business with lower property taxes, lower cost of, you know, entry south of the border, if you will. So anyway, these factors make for a great ease of wealth creation. So these days, my guest is investing in the United States of America by purchasing and renovating projects. Now he also has his own show and podcast and YouTube channel, which is called a Canadian investing in the U S where he provides all the information and advice to investors that are interested in investing both in Canada and the US. Well, my guest is invested in both the USA and Canada and understands the advantages of investing across borders to achieve even a higher return on investment on his, on his investments. And with that, welcome to the show, my guest, Mr. Glenn Sutherland. Hello there, Glenn. Oh, thanks for having me, Jay. Absolutely, Glenn. I'm excited to have you on. And uh, you and I were talking a little bit before the show. And so let me ask you a question. What was it about your business that got you into using private money? Uh, I think it was a necessity, right? Um, once, when you first start, if you're anything like me anyway, you start by using your own money and you can, you can do a few projects and you realize that you run out of money pretty quick. And you really have to start raising money somewhere along this line if you're really going to expand this, unless it's just a hobby. If you want to actually have a business and you're actually doing a lot of renovations or a lot of projects, you're, you're going to have to get money somewhere. And it's whether you go down the private route, whether you go down the joint venture route, or whether you go to like a bank or something to try and get some uh, uh, renovation money, right? To do it that way. But either way, you're going to have to do it with someone else's money. There's There's no way to to expand this into a business otherwise, or honestly, even to live off of this, this kind of business. So when you and I talk private money, what are we talking about? Are we talking about any kind of institutional money, any kind of banks? Uh, are we talking about doing business with individuals themselves? What's that look like to you? So I actually, I do a mix of everything, right? So it's not that I do um, just private money, which would be raising from individuals, which I do, I, I do, do go down that path. Um, I also take raise money by using doing joint ventures and making people equity partners instead of debt partners. And I also still go down the, the hard money path and do the, uh, the private loans from our hard money loans from the bank. So I, I do a little bit of all three methods, right? And uh, I think by diversifying, it, it, it breaks up the way your payments happen. So you're not actually having to come up necessarily with as much money every single month to even just to float all these renovations. Um, if, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, it, it does make sense. So what was your business and life like before you started raising private money? You said, you know, it was out of the, uh, out of the situation of, of a necessity. I mean, what was going on? What happened to where, um, you know, you said, Hey, I, I, I need to go raise some private money. What was going on? Yeah. So well, off the start, um, 
the way, the way maybe I'll just tell kind of like a story. So I started off by using like a home equity line of credit and I would use my own money to do re uh, renovate a project, you know, refinance it once I got a tenant in it and pull the money back. So like a burst strategy and I was doing that over and over again. Um, and, and that worked until I, I just wasn't able to do enough properties. Right. Um, so I started uh, then switching to using joint venture money and I would partner with people. And I was talking to a very wise man. I won't do any name drops, but he told me basically what I was doing was stupid. Um, I was giving away way too much of the projects of these renovation projects, because typically when I'm doing a fix and flip, I'm usually in and out within six months or I'm in and out by doing a refinance and keeping the property, right? So either way, I wasn't staying in these projects very long. Um, and to take on debt partner, or sorry, take on equity partners, I was giving away half of the project every time, right? I was doing all the money, doing all the work. They were getting their money back in a very short period of time. And it, it, it had some benefits that I was, it was easy to raise that amount of money, um, but it was hard to give away all that money, if that makes any sense. To to give keep giving 50% uh, of a project away is, is the way I was doing it, is tough, right? And actually, I still do it, um, but I I found that by using private money and paying for that, I, I could scale and do a lot more and I actually make more at the closing table. So whenever I was getting that, you know, 50, 100 grand check when you closed it, instead of giving half of that away, uh, I, I had been giving away, you know, 10 or 12% throughout the project, but there was still more meat on the bone for me at the end rather than doing this. And in all honesty, I don't know how what your listeners are usually used to hearing, but I, I like a mix. Um, and that's one of the reasons is to break up the payment schedules. When I'm doing joint venture money, I'm not giving away uh, or not making the payments every month because what happened when I was doing it all like 100% private money was the payments were killing me because I usually would always raise 100% of the project. I wouldn't raise the 110 or more percentage than what the actual project was. So when I was making the payments every month for the renovation, it was coming out of the cash flow from the projects that I'd already done. And really, I felt like I was spinning my wheels. One hand was paying the other hand. My personal like net worth was going up, but I was just paying one side to the other side, one side to the other side, and I wasn't really getting anywhere. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I switched. So now I like to do, um, depending on the situation, I like to do probably about 70, 30 mix of doing private money and uh, joint venture money, right? Just to have different amounts and get different, get, be paying at different amount times, right? Um, because like typically when I do a joint venture, instead of private money, I pay at the end, right? So it's nice to do that. Um, and I don't know about you, J uh, Jay, but if it would be, it would be awesome. Uh, a lot of private money doesn't like to get paid at the end. They like to have an ongoing, almost cash flow coming off from the payments. So that that's the one hard part I have, but I do, I do both ways. Tell me the story about how you found, where you found your very first private lender and how did that conversation go and how did the experience go to where they actually came on board with you? <laughs> so my first one isn't probably the best one to tell because the, the first private lender was on my very first project and my very first private lender was my grandmother. Um, and uh, my second private lender was my parents because I, I was just told, talked about the deal, how good a deal this was. And they're like, here's the money. And I was just like, well, that's not what I was going for, but this is a lot easier than, than doing it myself. Right. Um, but what happened later on as I, I was growing this, what one of the ways I did, um, one of the first ones I accepted money on was I took multiple people's money on, which I know is kind of a, a frowned upon thing and I'm, something I don't do anymore. Uh, but one of my first projects, I took on multiple private lenders so that they could put in a small amount of money. Um, and they were found um, from back when I had employment, right? Um, and just talking about what you do all the time, uh, people get interested in it and they're interested in a higher return than whatever the bank is usually giving them for their you know, their terrible savings account <laughs> rates. Um, so basically I took a bunch of people's money and we did a project in Florida. And when we were done, um, I paid them back. And what happens, even when you're borrowing a small amount of money, uh, a lot of people are a little skeptical off the start and they were willing to, to give it a shot and willing, they gave an amount that they were willing to lose. But when they were done and I made the payment schedule perfectly, I paid them every single month when they asked to be paid, like per the, per the contract, we did promissory notes. And when we were done the project, 
uh, we paid them back their money or we sent them the email that here, we'd like to pay your money. Can you send us the wiring instructions for the whole amount? And they were all of a sudden were like, you know what? Keep the money and here's more money. If you can do it with that amount of money, could you do it with a much larger amount of money? And I found that that was a nice way to do it. And one of the ways that I do this now, if I'm trying to raise private money, is to work on like a smaller project with a newer investor because it's a lot easier for them to invest in something smaller. So what do I mean by that? A lot of times that means doing like a flip or a burr in like the Midwest or, you know, central United States, which has uh, the purchase prices are a lot cheaper than working in anywhere on the edge. Right. So that I can show proof of concept, show that I make my payments every time on time and I don't bother them. And at any time that there is an issue with anything in the project, um, unless it means that we're going to go late, but any other issue, um, I approach them and, uh, or sorry, I don't approach them. I just figure it out. I find the money, I make their payments and we always go fine. And that's one of the reasons too, is I use private money even when I don't need private money. Um, and the reason is when there's bumps in those projects, stuff goes out of scope, uh, thing projects don't sell as fast as they should sell. I have the money to be able to make it perfect for the joint venture or sorry, for the private lender. I, I want this project to be as seamless as possible. I want this to be the easiest thing that they ever do so that they're willing to give me more money. <laughs> Are you saying uh, private lenders, when you start doing business with them, always have more than they tell you initially? That's what I've found. They, they've, <laughs> they've never told me their whole bankroll ever. <laughs> I always get started with a small amount, like here's 50, here's a hundred grand, see what you can do. And then you do a proof of concept and then, uh, then they're more interested. Yeah. I, I don't know what your, what your history has been, but I've never even offered the whole. Oh, it's, it's, it's been exactly the same. They always have more than they tell you. Right. Oh, I yeah. mean, I, I started out with a new private lender. Of, um, oh, just a few months ago on yeah. the first deal. And, um, what did they have 30 or 40,000 and we cashed that one out. And next thing I know they got 300,000. So, <laughs> oh, mercy. So, uh, what's your favorite, um, method? What's your most effective method? Should I say for raising private money? Um, I don't know if this is the most effective method or not, but I, a lot of times I just, um, I, I don't try to raise is this, this craziest thing is a lot of times I do a podcast, a uh, YouTube channel. Um, I'm just constantly giving content out and people uh, tend to come to me and ask what I have actually for options. Um, what, what, what is available? Um, I tend to try to stay away from like investing with friends or family anymore. Um, it was a good way to start building this thing. Uh, but in all honesty, it's, it, you know, you don't want to have that extra, uh, cause I have worked with people and even when it goes successful, it, it changes your, um, conversations when we hang out, <laughs> you, you're, you're more talking about the business instead of just, uh, having a social drink or whatever. Right. Um, but a, a lot of times I don't have like a formal way. I'm not usually going to raise, uh, the way I normally do. Uh, people will approach me, uh, I'll keep track of their information. And when I have a project, uh, I'll kind of make some notes about what, how our conversation had went in the past and what they're interested in doing and what kind of money, if they even mentioned that, that they were interested in doing. And then when we have a project, then I would go back and circle to them. Um, the thing about my projects is typically I'm working in like the cheaper States. So, and my projects are short. So oftentimes I use the same uh, lenders over and over and over and over again, because if I can keep returning their money every six months, as soon as they get it back, they're just like, go do it again. Right. Um, so I think it, a lot of it was harder off the start and where I was literally almost trying to hunt people down. But now that they come to me a little easier, it's a, well, it's a lot easier to just to, to do your business. And I'm not worried about the raising of the money. I'm worried about finding enough projects that will give the returns that I can pay them and be comfortable with it. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a good problem. I mean, which, you know, which would you rather have uh, more money than you can use or not enough money? Right. So I've got about a um, million and a half dollars right now, what I call sitting on the shelf yep. from private lenders that I've paid off that they're waiting for me to, you know, put that money back 
um, you know, back to work for them. But you know, when you got private money at your disposal, I mean, how, how much more confident, uh, particularly with a newer real estate investor, how much more confident and bold, how many more offers are you going to make when you know you got cash burning a hole in your pocket, right? Yeah, no. And you, you will. Yeah, exactly. It's confidence. You will come off sounding more confident because you don't need them and you won't come off as salesy because you don't need them. Like, especially if when I'm talking to people and, or I'm pitching a project, I know that if they don't take it, uh, there's other people going. I accidentally sent one of my deals to the wrong list and I had 27 people wanting to do the flip with me. And I went, I had to do, um, what do you call it? Like kind of interviews for two days to figure out who was the best one. I'm like, this is the worst. This took up so much time. I had to answer the same question 30 times. And I was like, you know what? I'm never, if I ever do this again, I'm going to have like an FAQ sheet that's going to go out and this is going to summarize the whole thing because I'm not going to do this. Normally, I don't approach it that way. I usually go with one or two people, show them the deal, and usually one of them scoops up or I go to one or two more people and, and go that way because I, so, I don't want to have all those conversations. I don't. I know what you mean, man. So what are your reasons uh, or what are the benefits of private money? Uh, and I know you say you use both. You use hard money and private money. First of all, I got a two part question, Glenn. Sure. So what's the difference between hard money and private money? And secondly, what are the benefits of private money over hard money? Okay. So there's a few things there, but yeah. Um, private money, you're not going to probably don't have the same setup fees to start with. Right. Um, sometimes I've paid 12 and two, right? So two points in order to do it. Sometimes it's, 10 and two, sometimes it's just zero setup fee and we're just going to do it. So it's a lot more affordable when I'm doing um, a fix and flip loan. Uh, I'm going to have to go get an appraisal done or often two appraisals, an ARV appraisal, a current appraisal. Uh, I'm going to have to give basically uh, everything that I've, my whole track record, fill out a lot of paperwork for the lender. Um, basically tell them my whole life story, how many projects I've done per year and hope that they will lend me the money. Right. Um, which usually they do. Right. Um, there's been very few cases, just whether they, what loan to value they decide on. Um, so that was the one, those are some of the big things, but, um, like private money is a far superior product cause you have a lot less hoops to jump through. It's a lot more flexible. Um, when I do some of the things for payments, that's a little different. Um, when I do, um, for instance, like, uh, a hard money loan. I'm going to be paying for interest based on the money I've used. Whereas when I do a private money loan, I typically take the entire purchase and renovation budget right at the start. So I'm paying interest on the whole amount instead. So it's kind of the difference between a loan and a line of credit is the way I'm paying for the renovation. So there is some slightly differences, but the, my main thing that where I go is it's the setup fees. Um, I just got bid out for, uh, a 100% loan to value purchase and reno, but there was $16,000 in setup fees. And I'm not even lying. It was $16,000 in setup fees, which really it eats into your profit. You're going to have to make sure that those numbers work for you. Um, so yeah, um, those, those are some of my big differences between the two. But one thing I want to say is to not uh, totally go, I'm never going to do a hard money loan. Um, if I never did hard money loans when I started, I don't think I would have learned how the bank runs these projects, right? So how they do draws, how they only pay for completed work. It was a good learning curve that I could copy to build my own systems to use in my own business. But it's an expensive product to learn off of, but it is, it, it was helpful. And that's how I run everything now, right? I have to do the inspections. I have to do it all because I don't have a bank that is necessarily checking to see if I've actually you know, that the renovation's done. They're knocking around. When you're not doing a construction draw, you're not having someone actually show up to the property from the bank. So you're going to have to do that step and you just want to copy the exact same thing. Yeah. And the phrase uh, that you're saying, uh, Glenn, there in Canada, setup fees, um, I would suppose Canadian setup fees are what we would call in the United States, origination fees Free. or yes. points, points, yes. origination fees, yes. Canadian terminology, uh, setup fees. So when you're borrowing hard money, uh, what are your average points or origination fee percentage of your loan amount? 
Uh, well, it depends. And honestly, I, I don't usually do a lot of hard money, but I was just going through the application uh, last week, so I have some of them fresh. But we were paying two points, uh, 9.75 uh, for a rate. Um, and also, I'm a Canadian, right? So um, as an American, you probably can get some better things. But um, I was paying 9.75 rate, 12-month um, term, uh, and you know, interest only, 100% uh, leverage of the repurchase and the renovation. Yeah, and in the world of in the world of private money, uh, what kind of setup uh, fee or origination fees do you pay? Well, it, it if it depends who I'm getting the money from. If I'm going borrowing the money from an experienced private money lender um, who is like just still a person, but that's what they do for a living, um, a lot of times they ask for two percent off the start. If I go and find the money myself from conversations and people I've met at meetups, I usually pay zero. Zero exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, for, from a private lender, I've never paid points origination fees in my life. <laughs> oh, I've, I've done it a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mercy. Well, I tell you what, um, I was just thinking, Glenn, as we were talking about private money, I'm so excited. I just finished writing a new private money guide uh, that will get anyone, a seasoned real estate investor or a brand newbie, a uh, real estate investor uh, or a wholesaler that wants to like stay in deals. So um, if you want a, a guide that will get you on the fast track to private money, you can just go on over to jayconner.com forward slash money guide, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. It's free, download it, and it will get you on the fast track to making your own rules and, and never missing out on a deal for not having the funding. So I know one of or your expertise, in addition to private money, Glenn, is you are living in Canada, but you're investing in the United States. So I'm very curious as to how do you do this real estate investing thing and it's many, many miles. The property is, um, I would assume, is many, many miles away from, uh, you know, where do you live? So how do you do this virtual real estate investing? What are the key points? Well, there's a few things depending on which, which direction we're going. But for uh, simplicity, a lot of it is um, I'm, I'm going to be buying instead of using like my own sub trades when I'm doing renovations, I tend to hire contractors that will be uh, hire their own sub trades to complete projects. So uh, it takes one thing off the plate and one less thing to to manage. And then a lot of times you, you need to have, still have someone check the work. And a lot of times that's where I'll bring in, uh, you know, anybody really to check the work because I'm going to check the work of the people who check the work. And what I mean by that is um, if I say I hired a property manager just to go and go over and the contractor says that the, the drywall is done and the roof's done on a roof. <laughs> and um, I sound a little Canadian there. But um, what, what I'll have them do is I'll, I'll go in and be like, you need to um, take pictures for me. And I need like, if they say the trim's done, I want pictures of every single trim corner that doesn't look right and a description of what corner that is because I need to get it fixed before I go. So it, it's just a little bit different where I'm not actually on site but I can send somebody there and they don't have to be um, someone who's knowledgeable about construction. Um, it's just someone who, if I go and tell them exactly what I want, they can go do that thing. Uh, so uh, if there was a roof being done, I could go and say, can you go and see if there's two layers of shingles? I want angles from the side. I want to see the eaves troughs are on straight. Um, you can give them a list and they can get photographs for you. So that's the one part about doing managing the construction from a distance. And then the other part is just like there's taxes, there's corporate structure um, and everything's a little it's very similar, uh, but it's a little bit different. Like instead of using an LLC, um, I would use an LP limited partnership uh, as being as a Canadian or a C Corp. Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't do as an LLC because um, I can revenue doesn't like it. Um, I file my taxes every year with the IRS first, and then I file them with Canada Revenue after based on the return I get from the IRS. Um, so it, it, there's a, a whole bunch of little intricacies, but it's uh, it's just, I guess, being the distance thing after the after you sort of file, uh, file out all the weird distance things. It's just it's the same thing over and over again. Right. It, it sounds really complicated. And with a lot of this stuff, I don't need to see houses. I don't need to walk houses. I need someone who 
who I know and I trust to walk these houses and to bid out these houses, right? Um, and so a lot of times it's the same contractor in the same city that I do over and over and over again. It's not me trying to reinvent the wheel too much. Mind you, this year I did expand into two new markets, uh, so I did have to reinvent the wheel. But <laughs> normally it's building a system, uh, having someone else do a lot of the legwork and finding the deals for me. Uh, and then I just do a quick analysis or a thumbs up or thumbs down based on the analysis I've been given and then turn it over to the contractor, set the, the checks and balances in place to have all their work checked. Uh, and well, actually before that, uh, if say you got the project from a wholesaler, it would be having uh, pulling my own comps, having a realtor verify my comps, pulling my own uh, rent comps, uh, having a property manager verify the rent comps um, and then negotiating the property down or having somebody from my team negotiate the property down. Um, so it's a lot of it you can just sub out. <laughs> Are you preferring to invest in um, metropolitan areas, larger cities, smaller markets? Um, what's the average size market you're investing in now? Yeah, so um, it's, it's usually... I, oh, there's usually a metropolitan or, or a city around it right, that is good, but it doesn't, or like a larger city, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm investing there. Uh, for instance, like we did some properties in uh, Palm Bay, Florida, which is not far from Jacksonville. Um, and then we work in Dayton, Toledo, Kansas City, Missouri, Indianapolis, which Indianapolis is a big city on its own. But say even for like Dayton, for instance, which is not a really big city, we'll work in the the suburbs around the city. Um, and in, a lot of it is just trying to find um, the numbers at work, right? I just need to be able to have the ARV, the purchase and the rental all to, to line up, right? To, to make this, this whole thing work. And I'm not biased to the size of the city unless I'm keeping it. And the reason is, is I've had some lenders that just say, hey, uh, I'm not interested in that because that city is, that's a, there's only 5,000 people that live in that town, right? So they won't do it, right? So it has to basically be a flip. And if I'm going to do a flip in a small town, I better be ready for it to sit on the market a little bit longer. So my numbers need to have space for that. Um, and where this happened, I was buying in Huntsville, Alabama, and just south of that is Lacey Springs. And when we were buying there, um, that's exactly what happened. Lenders weren't interested in, the town was just too small. It was still in the zip code of Decatur, but it wasn't big enough for lenders to even touch it. So you're working in cash and then you're, you're basically your exits are, you're, you have limited act, the exits on it. So you, it's going into this market we're going into, or could be going into right now. Uh, it, I'd more prefer to be in a big city where you have more exits. You mentioned a moment ago that um, recently, in recent months, you actually went into two new markets. When you're going into a new market, Glenn, how do you start finding and building your team? So this is a two-part question. Yeah. What team members do you need on your team to make this run virtually? Yeah. Um, and how do you find them? Okay. So the big ones are going to be the, the property managers, the contractors. Um, funny enough, because one of our new markets is Michigan, the, the make sure that your lenders and insurance will actually lend to you there. Um, so I found out that my insurance company from California will not lend in Michigan or not from that lend, uh, will not insure in Michigan. So, um, I had to find a new insurance company, uh, which I never even thought that that would be a thing. I figured that they, they've lended for me all over the country, that that would be a, a non-issue. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of those things I'll get that way. I'll need to find those out. And usually a lot of times I like to go with referrals, um, but referrals are only so good because when you go and ask for a referral uh, for a contractor, people don't usually give you good contractor referrals because if a contractor is really good, typically they're going to use them themselves. And contractors have a finite amount of people or renovations that they can work on at a time. So they may have five teams and can handle 15 renovations at a time. Um, and if they're really good and they're an experienced investor, what I would do, even what I do with my other my teams, is if they're really good and they can handle it, I'll find 15 projects for them. And, and that's how we'll do it. Um, so that's the hard part is getting the contractors. But property managers, uh, wholesalers, those people want to be found. So those ones are usually easy to, uh, to find. Um, you can... <laughs> 
<laughs> you could bait a wholesaler if you really wanted to. You could just put an ugly property up on Craigslist or something. And you'll have a bunch of them call you. Um, but you can find a lot of these are just sitting in bigger pockets or Facebook forums that are going there. Um, you know, do your due diligence. And like always, you don't pay them any money. Everything goes through a title company. Um, but that's how, that's how I build. I would actually really tell you how I built my team. Um, that's that's kind of how I do it. Is I, I I'll get referrals for some of the base pieces, and then referrals from those base pieces out to the other pieces. Um, a lot of times when I start a new market, a property manager could do a light renovation for you. Um, property managers do um, handle turn tenant turnovers, so they can always handle paint, carpet, kitchens. Um, light stuff. Um, they usually have referrals to for mechanicals, like HVAC, plumbers, electricians, and it's sometimes a way to get started um, before you move yourself onto a proper contractor. So sometimes it's a good way to just get your toe in the door. And then um, with everything, I usually like to get receipts from property managers um, and then contact all the receipts and actually get uh, talking to them directly so that you can figure out if they are affiliated to an actual contractor or something like that to uh, a good a good referral out. Awesome, Glenn. Well, Glenn, um, uh, there may be someone or some ones that actually want to do business with you and, and, and invest with you in your business uh, and or learn how you do this thing from Canada over to the U.S. So uh, I know you've got your own podcast. You got your own show. Uh, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Um, yeah, so probably the best way is glensutherland.com. Um, that's probably the easiest one from there. You can find the YouTube channel, the podcasts, the coaching, it, it links, everything links out from there. Um, so glensutherland.com or Canadian investing in the U S or Canadian investing in the USA. I own all the domains. They all go to the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. So, uh, Glenn's website is, uh, www.glenn, G L E N. That's one N G L E N. Sutherland, S U T H E R L A N D dot com. That's Glenn with one N, Glenn Sutherland dot com. Glenn, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been wonderful having you. Oh, thanks for having me, Jay. This was fun. Awesome. Well, there you have it, my friend. Another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. Here's to seeing you right here on the next Raising Private Money show. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jayconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.